Leading from above the line is a philosophy that recognizes our leadership is built on five sources of inner power. Principal consciousness, purpose, emotional mastery, understanding change, and knowledge empowerment. We have talked to Dr. Ferguson, the developer of this philosophy, about the first two sources of power, which are principal consciousness and purpose. And he has shared with us that, these, that our leadership development is based on our ability to build and grow ourselves with respect to these sources of, of power through a process of self-introspection and then development. Today we're focusing on emotional mastery. So Theo, help us to understand a little bit about what you mean by emotional mastery. I think most of us will sense our emotions as feelings. Okay. There's various states, emotional states that we go through during the course of a day and we say we feel happy, we feel angry, we feel upset and so on. So it's a measure of how and our feelings reflect a state of mind that right. we have. And these can be positive and these can be negative. Um, we all come into the world hardwired with a set of negative emotions. Emotions that at one time in our evolutionary process served us well and kept us alive and helped us to survive as a species. But in this modern world that in which we lived, in which we are all socially networked and we, are, and we are challenged to live together as communities, challenged to build great homes, great organizations, these negative emotions can become a handicap for us. Mm. And we are now challenged to take control of our emotions so that we can bring out the best in ourselves. Gafili to, to take control of ourselves means that we're going to be at the mercy of our emotions as we go through life. But that being out of control means that we're not going to live the fulfilled life that we really want to live. Right. And, and our, life, our life could be highly compromised. So emo mastery of the emotions helps us now to be able to bring that control into our lives so that we don't compromise our own lives. Now, Daniel Goldman, mm -hmm. uh, who is a well-known author, has shared with us the concept of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. How is emotional mastery different from emotional intelligence? Yeah. I would qualify that by saying the beautiful concept of emotional intelligence. Because ah. it had tremendous impact on me when I first read his book. And it's a book I have shared with all my children because I thought it was, I call it essential reading. So I have great appreciation for the work of Daniel Goldman. In leading from above the line, we have chosen to use the term emotional mastery because we believe this better describes what we're trying to achieve in terms of ma emotional, mastering emotion as a source of power. So it's beyond recognizing the emotion. Yeah, it's been beyond having intelligence about the emotions. It's be, it's, it takes into the realm of bringing control so that you have that greater self-control. But this is not to take away from Daniel Goldman to emotional intelligence, which I like. But we opt to use the word emotional mastery instead because it is, in a sense, more descriptive of what we are trying to accomplish. Now, you've talked about the negative emotion. What, what, are, what about positive ones? Are there... The, what are they? the positive emotions are the emotions uh, that are the antidotes for the negatives. In order to deal with the negatives, let me mention some negatives here. Yeah. Negatives will, be, will include the emotion of, say, our ego okay. or selfishness um, and or greed. Often, often not talked about as much as an emotion, but it's a, it's a state of mind that drives us to express uh, uh, how to live in a very selfish way where we, we seek to acquire for ourselves rather than for others. Um, then there's anger and hatred. Right? Then there's an emotion like gluttony, 
which is destroying the Western world today. We're all consuming a lot more than we should be consuming. Mm, that's and it's really, an, it's really an emotional state that is destroying us, a negative emotional state. Then we have lust, and I want to limit lust to the sexual department here now. Our lustful behaviors, and lust is perhaps the most intensive of all the negative emotions that we feel, and one that can really destroy us. And we've seen many, many leaders become compromised. Well, not just around lust, but compromised around the ego and the sense of power, around corruption, which is really greed, and, right. and, and so on. And then we have fear, Another, and a whole range of associated emotions. And we're going to bring in the business of stress and all of that. Those are all emotional states that are mostly negative, not always negative, mostly negative in our lives. And if we don't take, if we don't have the ability to master them, to take control, then we live at the mercy of these emotions and we lose control over our own behavior. Right. Yeah. Can we lose control over the positive emotions as well? And does that compromise us? You know, I always, a little piece of advice, I, I, I say, anytime you feel too excited about something, as somebody in love, Right. Which is a positive emotions, emotion. Or you feel extremely angry about something. In both situations, you take some time to reflect. Because both situations can lead you to make unreasonable decisions. decisions. So yes, one has to at all times take time to reflect on ourselves so that we don't, we have the self-control that we need. Right? Yeah. So now, how do we go about developing this mastery and gaining this mastery over our emotions? Continuous trying. Put it simple. We're going to be tested in life. Let's take anger. I've had to battle that in my own personal life. Because, in the sense you grew up, deal with anger is something that everybody expresses. And, and it's the norm. Sometimes. The norm, yeah. And, you don't really hear people telling you about really taking control. But then I discovered the danger of, of, um, of anger when I was already an adult. And I behaved, I had an experience once where I really lost it and I said things that I regretted afterwards. And, I, and it was about the same time I was reading um, Gandhi's book, Experiments in Truth. And I got a wake up call. I said, wait now. You know, I don't have to behave like that. I can behave differently. I, have, I can have control. And I've been trying to bring that control into my life for quite a lot of years now. I haven't achieved perfection yet. But it is a matter of, it's tied up with a whole business of introspection and taking time to reflect on our behaviors and making a commitment to do better the next time. And every time you make that commitment to do better, you help to engrave a pathway in your head. You see, as human beings, we come into the world with what we call the cerebral cortex. Although we are hardwired with the negative emotions as human beings, okay, it's part of our primitive, ex uh, that carry over from our primitive existence. Right. But now, we, as human beings, we are hardwired, sorry, we come into the world with what we call the cerebral cortex. And that now we are challenged to wire ourselves. We have to write that piece of software now. And it's that piece of software that we are challenged to write that gives us the ability to override our negative behaviors. And we write that software by continuously trying to, or to consider reminding ourselves that we can do better than we did before. Right. And that helps us now to lay down that circuitry and ultimately gives us tremendous amount of control so that we don't, uh, our emotions don't carry away, but rather we can check it quite early and we can bring self-control into our lives and we can now behave in keeping with our conscience and all that we know is right. At one time, we, it was quite popular for us to encourage persons who are angry, for example, mm -hmm. to play out that anger. I know that that neuroscience is now telling us that we need to not do that, but to rework and remap the neural pathways as you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. In fact, we were making it worse. That's right. Yeah, much worse.
But now we know that it is through the continuous trying and a continuous process of trying to bring the control into our lives that we become better. For example, I'm still not um, there are situations in my life where anger is triggered, something ticks me off. And when I calm down, it's my moment now to reflect and say, wow, that wasn't very nice. I think I can do better than that. Next time, and to tell myself, next time I encounter a situation like that, I will do better. And that is me helping to put down that, bring that control into my life. So next time I encounter a situation, I'm going to do better than I did before. And that is why emotional mastery is a lifetime exercise. You don't go to a, a one-week training course on emotional intelligence or emotional mastery and come out knowing how to master it. Master emotions, no. Yes. And um, it doesn't work that way. It takes time and you have to keep on trying. And every time you slip, you have to remind yourself you could do better. So a lot of positive self-talk. Uh, critical to the, whole, to the whole process. And you can do a lot of that through your introspective, through the introspective process. There's no magic wand that you could wave that, that allows you to do that. It's not about intelligence, you know. Okay, I know emotion, this is bad for me. And therefore next time I will do it right. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Even when you know what you should be doing, and that the anger is, is bad and all the other emotions are bad, it doesn't work that way because these emotions well up in you. I say they come out of the, what they call the amygdala or primitive brain. Right. And we don't get rid of that, that there for a purpose. And so we have to control it now through the higher brain, the cerebral cortex. That's where we bring the control from, to put a break on the behavior of that more primitive brain that we have called the amygdala. Very, very interesting. So is there a, a, a different kind of process or a process that you can share uh, for this replacement? You said, you said the positive emotion replacing okay. the negative emotions. Emotional mastery is only possible when you can replace the negative emotions with something positive. You cannot get rid of your negative emotions. You can't say, I'll get rid of my anger. Right. Until you bring something positive in this place, that anger is always there. And the positives now will now include love, the ability to love other human beings so that you don't find yourself getting upset and angry with them, ability to forgive others, your ability to be humble and to recognize that you are, you are a human being just like another human being and you can deal with them in a different way, ability to build your sense of confidence in yourself and to know and that would now helps you now to be able to express more of the love that you have and the forgiveness that you have. That is how we displace the, neg the negative emotions. Okay. But you know, we don't like the word love. You know? It you know seems that? unusual yeah. in some organizations. Especially in organi organizational settings. We like to talk about building organizational harmony. You know those nice sounding words? What are we talking about? Suppose at the root of it all is love. love. Yeah, that's all we're talking about. But the word love, like morality, sometimes terrifies us. But we need a lot more love within our organization. That's how we're going to build more better organizations. That's true. That's true. Now, can you share some examples, or maybe one example, where lack of emotional mastery has compromised the leadership of people who were on the rise? I can share the examples without calling names. Right. By just describing. I'm pretty sure our audience here is familiar with people who have huge egos. And when an individual has a huge ego, they very they very become very thin skinned. Yes. Yeah, very thin skinned. And there is and the slightest what they, what you may say something and they, they interpret it as a threat to their ego. Right. And they respond to you in aggressive with a lot of aggression and sometimes violence. It happens at the highest political level, mm -hmm. but it also happens in our social setting. The people who go out on a Friday evening to the, 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 the nightclubs and the bars and so on, and you know sometimes somebody, somebody says something to another individual in that setting that they interpret as an insult. Oh, yes. Yeah, and then they decide to return, return it in kind with, a, with even more hurtful words. And you know what can happen? 
in quick time you got a fight, in quick time you might even have a dead body on the floor. All because of a lack of ability to manage your emotions, to master your emotions. You respond out of control, only to have regrets thereafter. Does futuristic thinking have something to do with this mastery? Because I know when Gandhi said, for example, that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, he would have had some notion that if we engage in this behavior continuously, we can only be hurting the world. Yes, and that's what we're doing in the world today. The arrogance and the violence that we have in the world today, a lot of it is associated with the inability of people to bring control into their lives. And a lot of the wars that we fight, a lot of the the discriminatory behavior that we have across the world, a lot of how we treat the downtrodden and so on has to do with people having a sense of superiority, people having inflated egos over others. And then, and once that ego grabs you, violence follows very quickly. Mm. Harsh words and violence. And it has to try to protect that ego of yours. Mm. So, we have to build a world and with a much greater level of, level of understanding where people can display a much higher level of emotional mastery. Right. So that, and we can only do that by greater understanding, bring more love into the world, more forgiveness. I want to get your response to, to a statement that is aligned with contingency theories of leadership. And it is sometimes claimed that you have to know when to use anger and sometimes this is called for. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, there was a time in my life I was, I was um, in that place. <laughs> I, I must tell you, I'm no longer in that place. I'm, what a relief. Yes, there's this belief that you have to insult and threaten people. That's really what you're talking about here yes. all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know, to say, if I don't be, if I don't behave like that then I can't get things done. Uh, yes. So I have to behave like that. Yes. No, I don't, I, that might give you some short-term gains, but in the end, you know, um, and you can f induce fear, okay, what's what you're doing? Inf induce fear in people to get things done. But eventually, you don't really receive the admiration, the respect from those people. You, know. you might get to make some, sh what appears to be short-term gains, but in the long run, the people around you we we'll see you in a very negative way. So you're compromising your you're, leadership? You're tremendously. And, and I don't have, um, that approach is, I say, just for short term gains. In the long run, you lose. And based on what you're saying, I can see how, if you're compromising your leadership in that way, you're compromising your, your very integrity, of course. your principal consciousness, and so on. Yeah. Because they, go, they, they must be aligned. And remember, anytime somebody behaves like that, we ever say, you, know, you look, they look ugly. You know what it means? They greet the rest of the people around them. Yes. They come over in a, in a very harsh and inhumane way. Yes. Yeah. Sadly though, a lot of organizations run on that basis. Eh? And those, are all, those, those kinds of behaviors are really acts of violence against other human beings. It, yes. Eventually, it all backfires. Yes, we're seeing a new trend in, even in the literature uh, on leadership about conscious capitalism and so on, <laughs> you know? Um, that how, is... How do we push this philosophy along? An attempt to give a good face to capitalism. That's why it's called conscious capitalism. I know there are a couple of books written, interesting books written. But the more fundamental question is, can... Capitalism, which is essentially managed greed, that's what it is, if we are to be honest with ourselves. Can it, can it be, can you really give it a nice face in its entirety? My own belief is that ultimately we have to revisit the whole concept of cap capitalism. Talk to all economists around now and they tell you it's not, whatever we're doing now is not sustainable. Right. So we can see the problem. The, the, the big question is, what do we replace it with? That's really the issue that is occupying the great minds and all of right. universities who start trying to study leadership and so on at the moment. And, but we haven't found that magic formula yet 
to replace it. So we live, we live on it knowing that it is second best. It's not really right. what will survive in the long run. And bringing more principles to whatever system we're working with. Yeah. yeah. You've got to have a, a system that is much more humane than the one that we have. Okay, the one that we have now uh, helps to grow a lot of rich people. I mean, the world, the individuals are getting richer and richer. That's right. And, and this world. And then we have a large part of this population that's not getting any richer in anyway. the poor. And the question is how to bring fairness into the world, how to bring a sense of balance. And until the world finds a sense of balance, we're going to be at war with ourselves. Yeah. And we're at war with and ourselves. With each other. And with each other at the moment. So we have to continue that search. And we offer leading from above the line as a philosophy that can help us in that search and to sort of lay a platform or lay some boundaries. And within those boundaries, hopefully we're going to, we could, our new system would emerge. But we need a new system without doubt. Very good. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about principal consciousness, purpose, emotional mastery, and I suppose our little discussion on the changing face of the world or the way in which we want to change the world is, is a good uh, entry into our next discussion on Understand. understanding change. Yeah. yeah, you know, most of us come into the world and accept it as it is. And we just try to fit in, find see how we can fit in. But you know some of us got to work and help them to change the world. Yeah. Because that's the only how we're going to create a better world for all of us. Well, I do believe that we all change the world whether we want to or not by our very presence. But, but not, not necessarily changing it in a positive way. That's right. Yeah? Yes. And we have to find ways now to help to change the world so that our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and so on can enjoy a better world. It's part of what we are called on to do by being alive, you know. Too many of us just accept it. They say, that is the way life is. Let's just find a way to fit in. Right. We need more people who, are going to, who must say, no, I'm not, going to, I'm not accepting what is there. I'm going to try to find a way to help it to become better. And leave and a proper legacy. I leave a proper legacy. And that's what leading from above the line is all about. Trying to find a way to build a better world from all, all of us. Trying to build better human beings. So, the, so we can look back perhaps a hundred years later and say, we started something and we see the fruits of it now. This is not an over, this the fruit's not gonna appear overnight. But right. in time we believe we're gonna see the fruits of a coming out a more positive world, a better world for yes. all of humanity. It's about getting on the right path. Getting on the right path. Yeah. And I'm very pleased that, that for example your institute, the the Athologia Graduate School of Business, you you've embraced the philosophy. Yes. And that to me is very heartening. But as I warned you, it's gonna be very challenging. Yeah. Because you, the world out there not going to just open to accept right. the new things that easily. So be prepared. I will. <laughs> Thank you very much yeah. to you.